Well, so, are you in the right meeting? Um, when I first heard about WSN in the late 60s, I actually, what's it say, naturalist? I actually was wondering, is this is like a nudist society. Um, and I think people like Mark Carr still think it is, but. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, um, it turns out, I thought that I had to do some research for this history, it turns out that nudist organizations don't actually call themselves naturalists, they call themselves naturists. So um, if you happen to be here in the wrong meeting, now's your chance to. <laughs> um, so we're actually 100 years, Western Society of Naturalists. This logo to me is interesting as it emblem <coughs> emblematic of a lot of things that WSM does. This has been a fairly consistent regular logo, but we never voted on it. We never had a contest for it. It's just somebody came up with it one time and everybody liked it. The other thing about being a naturalist rather than a naturist is it'd be really uncomfortable to sit <laughs> Although, I don't doubt that some of you have tried it. Maybe after the tequila trophy, but who knows? Also, certain places, I mean, tropics may be the exception, and there's certain places where you know, it just wouldn't work. So, yeah, we pretty much are required to wear clothes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, and I just wanted to <clears throat> point out that we, Neil Hansen and Neil Sommer and I, uh, wrote a history up to 1996 and published by the Salem Harbor Natural History Museum. And so that's, it's actually very thorough, and if you really interested in a deep dive in the early years of the visit, um, I recommend that you have a look at it. It turns out there's only like five copies left, and three of them are in on stage for the, we'll be there for the silent auction, so there's your chance to get one. And maybe at some point, um, we'll put the entire thing on the website. <laughs> um, the other thing is this logo, Reach for the Stars, which is not very, not very nice. Um, there's some, there's some rituals of those posters in the silent auction, and I happen to have um, the only existing copy of that poster, which the artist colorized it, colored it. And I hope that gets put up for the regular auction. It should draw good, quite a bit of money. It's very nice. Okay, I want to <coughs> dive a little bit into the deep history of WSM and then talk about some recent trends. And we've just had a lot of talks about naturalists and natural history. Well, it turns out if you read what was happening in the early 1900s, um, naturalist was actually a person who um, <clears throat> accepted a certain philosophy, and that philosophy had to do not necessarily going out in the field, but it has to do with simply that nature contains all reality, and that was versus supernatural. These are very turbulent times. Um, <clears throat> science was really kind of just getting going. Um, and the founders were very um, concerned, and part of the reason they founded society was to sort of inform that, look, we should look at the natural world um, from a mechanistic point of view and reject supernatural explanations. So to some extent, you could be a naturalist then and not necessarily be a natural historian, although they go together very well. Um, and to point that out, uh, <clears throat> the naturalism, that philosophy of reality and nature goes all the way back to the Greeks, but it really didn't develop until the 16 to 1900s, particularly in the physical science. And one of the classic quotes that you may know about is from Laplace. Laplace, a very famous mathematician and physicist, French, um, wrote one of the first books on celestial mechanics, which actually explained it in terms of mathematics and physics. And the story goes that he gave that book to Napoleon, who was there for at the time, to read, and then he met with Napoleon. And Napoleon said, well, that's a very interesting book, there's no mention of the creator in here. And plus, replied, apparently, supposedly, I have no need of that hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> and I think that was important. And certainly, from biological sciences, um, the publication of Origin of Species was a critical development in a naturalistic approach to understanding nature. 
Um, and Ritter, who I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, <coughs> had this quote at the 1939 meeting, very involved in the Western Society. And he was, at that time, going beyond that. He said, look, we not only uh, want to reject supernaturalism in understanding nature, but we also want to reject it in terms of an understanding of human behavior. And uh, that's quite groundbreaking. And if, I mean, you follow the race developments of cognitive psychology and so forth, it really um, looks like that <coughs> progress is being made, made in that way. So where does natural history fit in? Well, historically, natural history it's the study of organisms um, in the environment. And, but it follows naturally, I think, that natural history is essential to many biological naturalists. And I think Darwin is the classic example. Ed Ricketts, uh, we just got mentioned, another classic example on the world of the sea. Um, so we tend to conflate the two, but I just want to point out that, um, in fact, originally, um, they had the meanings. So next, I want to I want to talk about a few of the founders that we didn't talk about in the '99 history. <clears throat> Part of that reason is there's always been a continual discussion in WSN about why don't we have more terrestrial work, et cetera, et cetera. And there have been efforts, Paul Dayton in particular, to get more terrestrial involvement. And so what happened? Well, it turns out when you really look at it. Some of the very key founders were, in fact, marine scientists. So we have our, our uh, history of marine science goes back. William Ritter, um, very famous, uh, essentially the founder of what became Scripps. Um, you can see Scripps in 1910. Uh, he was a UC Berkeley professor, but he was very interested and felt essential to have um, seaside laboratories and summer field courses or um, just places where academics could come, um, bring classes or whatever. And he traveled up and down the coast looking for a suitable site and finally ended up um, in San Diego and came across the Scripps family, who turned out to be very willing to support the eventual evolution of the Scripps. So he, and he, his PhD thesis at Berkeley um, was on um, eyesight and abilities, I think it was at Berkeley. But then he followed that up with work primarily in Tunicate. So he, he was well schooled in in marine biology. <clears throat> Another member was a 1919 um, president, a founder, um, <clears throat> Theodore Fry. He was essentially the prime mover in founding what is now Friday Harbor Laboratories. He was this old flyer from 1912. Um, he was at University of Washington. He directed the labs for many years, Friday Harbor. And he was a botanist, a marine. He was a general botanist, mostly in cryptogamic botany and ferns and so forth. But he also did marine work and very interested in marine algae and published the first paper on uh, how to age pterodophora. So again, roots in marine science. And then there's uh, David Starr Jordan, who was instrumental in founding Hopkins Marine Station, obviously uh, an ichthyologist, um, first president of Stanford, and so, <clears throat> but connected to marine science and Hopkins in 1892. And finally, the first, two, the first two years of the society, 1916, 1917, um, <clears throat> Bart Neverman was, was the uh, president, and he was the director of California, Cal Academy of Sciences, and worked closely with David Star Jordan, and uh, I mean, his fame, I mean, Jordan had, I guess, 28 fish named after him, but <clears throat> Everman had a whole family of fishes named after him, the sacred tooth fishes. Did I get that right, Greg? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fish is not fish, right? Fish is a Okay, that's it. I assume there are more than one silver tooth. All right. So, roots. <laughs> roots. Um, <clears throat> so I actually did some analysis, uh, kind of following on some of the work we did in the, in the early history. I was curious to look at trends in, in uh, contributing papers and posters. It's hard to get trends in actual attendance because in the early days there aren't any records. <clears throat> but the green line, so, and I did it by year pairs because I thought that well, maybe there's some years where because of the location of the symposium there would be really low attendance. So by looking at two years at a time, um, you know, I thought it might be more unbiased. But you can see here that green line has been a slow increase and where now papers and posters <clears throat> recently have gone really skyrocketed. And I thought, well, 
I knew some early years what was happening. I thought, well, maybe it was related to the development of West Coast Marine, Coast Marine Labs. And so I plotted the number of marine labs here. This is throughout the West Coast. And it turns out they're highly correlated. <clears throat> but then I thought, well, maybe it's just correlated with the population in California, which from which most of our members come. And yeah, it is. <laughs> it's very <laughs> so the actual causes are uncertain, and maybe some deeper analysis. Um, but I think what's particularly interesting, and, and I think somewhat troublesome and very important to where WSN goes in the future, is that notice this gigantic leap off the correlation. I'm starting in about 2000. Um, why is that? Well, I think two things have happened um, that I can think of. One is uh, we added posters, which increases the number. But also, we did this shift to the November, November meeting rather than meeting as we traditionally did between Christmas and New Year's. And I think that actually opened up a lot more uh, opportunities for people to attend. So um, that's what happened, and it's something that no doubt will be addressed. Um, how about topics? Um, this, these are two graphs for the 1996 thing. Um, you can see here, I just plotted in the upper one, terrestrial marine versus general. And you can see that in the early days, up until the uh, um, 1960s or so, um, there were a fair number of terrestrial papers. <clears throat> but then marine greatly increased. Um, and so what happened with the marine? Well, I already mentioned that the founders were actually strongly related to marine stuff. In the 1929 meeting, the winter meeting was held at Hopkins, and it was actually proposed by the society at that meeting that we should maybe orient the winter meeting more towards marine science. And part of that the reason was that in those days, there were actually two to three meetings a year. There was a winter meeting, which was mostly just WSN, and there were a couple other meetings, often with the Pacific Division of AAAS, um, um, where WSN also participated. And so that was a suggestion, and there was a little bump there, and I don't know what's causation. But then there's this quite steep rise in this region, and I think that is actually related to, this is the grand period of uh, marine lab formation, between 56 and 78, 14 new marine labs on the West Coast. Um, pretty <coughs> phenomenal. And though you may have noticed, a lot of them are just 50 years. There have been a lot of 50-year uh, celebrations this year, including Moss Land. Um, so the other thing is the uh, taxa distribution. How has that changed? Well, I didn't put the new, any new data on this one either because the taxa distribution, what kind of things people do, are kind of much the same except what's changed, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is community. But what's really changed is that rather than having papers on morphology of a particular invertebrate or a fish or physiology here, um, most of those papers are now related to the population or community ecology of that group or the whole assemblage. So that's uh, been quite a big shift. Um, so um, WSAM is now very marine ecological and with a growing focus on shore and new shore anthropogenic effects. And if you look at the percent of papers and posters the same way, you can see, well, starting about 1981, but particularly starting in about 2000, the number of ecology papers, related papers, have just skyrocketed even though they may incorporate physiology in ocean or anything else. The main objective is to figure out how it affects their ecology. And there's been an amazing increase in concentration on human effects um, and management. And there's certainly good reason. I had to clean this up a little bit. I actually said, go back. We did something else every day. But we obviously created some problems, and uh, the society members are trying to address them. Meeting evolution. One of the big changes in the meeting has been <clears throat> a greater and greater involvement of and support for students. We started student travel awards way back in 1963, best student paper awards in 1964. 1997, the student represented on the executive committee and then the student committee. And I put Matt up here as the first student uh, executive who was not only did that, but when uh, Greg and Jim Nybach and I were the secretariat, that was a critical student um, that really kept, kept thinking on the long. And then, then we have the student committee, which now organize symposia and workshops. And now, we just heard, we have uh, uh, some scholarships related to RAFE. Um, so it's been a, a real positive thing. 
Awards. Just heard about that. First Naturalist of the Year Award to Larry Harris. Um, and there have been a one almost every year since then, uh, honoring um, the folks that really get people out in the field, not necessarily to do academic stuff. And then the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, and I just talked about it there, um, to Joe Conn. The other thing <laughs> we've done is, uh, and we're partly related to helping students attend, is a uh, fundraising attitude adjusting. And in 1998, uh, President Rick Grossberg at the time organized the first uh, uh, auction, and, and Rafe was a, a great auctioneer for many, many years, <clears throat> amongst his other accomplishments. And then in 2003, the Tequila Pro Trophy, I did appreciate <laughs> mentioning that uh, Moss Landing won the first Tequila Trophy um, in 2003. Um, and we won it for a mere three hundred dollars. <laughs> now, since then, it, things have risen up, and we've gotten various people involved in raising money. You can see our president-elect here actively uh, selling the tequila trophy, and of course, Theo. You know, it's quite an honor to, to uh, get this um, get this trophy. But I also wanted to mention another picture. I want to mention Larry Allen. <laughs> if you look back over the history of the tequila trophy, and, and probably not just what he's paid for tequila there, but probably worldwide, he has probably spent <laughs> more money on tequila. And I was talking to Jeff <laughs> last night, and uh, she was talking about the first time they got the tequila trophy, and we, she says you're really worried because they weren't sure they had enough money to actually Hey, what they said they were going to pay. Oh. So they went around and they sold drinks out of the bottle for like 10 bucks a shot to recoup some of their... Anyway, whatever, it's fun. And it's raised, <laughs> it's raised a lot of money. Okay, so I'm, I'm at the end here. I didn't run too far over. So, how many years? We have changed some other things. This is the this classic photo. This is actually taken at the Coronado Marine Lab, which is the precursor to Scripps. Um, and it's not, it's 1904, it's not about WSM, but a lot of the WSM members or founders are there. And we've changed other things in addition to the Tia Trophy and so forth. The hairstyles have changed. <laughs> um, we dress more casually if compared to 2005, the group of presidents at that meeting. And we smile more. Um, I'm not sure. So after Tuesday, it's a little hard to smile, but let's keep trying to keep smiling. Uh, <laughs> the person in the top row, the third from the left, that's Ritter. That's also Ritter, who was, you know, as I pointed out, was really instrumental in founding, starting with that lab. Um, and I often think, you know, I wonder if Ritter had a buzz cut and a Hawaiian shirt and flip flops. You know, could he stand up here and give a talk? <laughs> well, so, anyway, I think we also have to keep in mind that fundamentally um, we are just a meeting. Um, we have done a few forages into publication and, and symposia, public and so forth, but fundamentally over the 100 years, with a little hiatus during World War II, um, we're just a meeting, but we're a very good meeting. Um, why is that? Um, and I think that's something we need to discuss in the business meeting as the meetings have grown and uh, I think there's been a broader spectrum of topics. We need to decide whether we want to be more, you know, shrink back and be more focused or do we want to get big and what are the pros and cons of that. Um, so what will WSM be <coughs> in 2116? Um, well, I'll show you. <laughs> All those who have served in any capacity on the executive committee or student committees or organize a symposium or organize a workshop, please stand up. Come on. Stand up. So these are some of the folks that have made it work and will make it work in the future. 
for all those of you that didn't stand up, oh, you need to do what you need to do to be able to stand up at some future look at who's contributed to the society. Because you're the folks that really make it run. So, thank you.